All right, good morning. Today is Wednesday, the 15th of March. And as it says up there, finally correctly, we're going to go over chapters four and five today. We should be able to handle both of them and still be able to be done in a, a couple hours or so. And uh, if we do that tomorrow, we'll do two things. We'll go over chapter seven, and afterwards we'll do a couple of the problems that are going to be assigned to you between chapters four, five, and seven. Friday is our typical lab day, and as it says, um, be a lab period, no taping will be done. But if we can follow that, and we'll see whether or not how it works, but if we can, Friday, I'll also send you out a copy of the pretest, and then I'll go over the pretest on Monday, and then we can have our test. We would have it then next Tuesday, which is the 21st. We'll see how that goes, but right now that's what I'm looking at doing. All right, your chapters one, two, and three written test labs and homework are due this Sunday. Your four, five, and seven will be due next Sunday. And next week, Wednesday or whenever, we will be either starting Tuesday or Wednesday, we'll be going over chapter six, which is on the document object model. All right, so with all that said, let's jump right into it. I don't want to sit and, and read to you, but I will tell you that one of the things that happens in this chapter is we start to make a transition. And what I mean is we are kind of, for lack of better words, we are transitioning over from from using, um, sorry, from, from using the equivalent of prompts and alerts to actually taking JavaScript and making it interact directly with our HTML that's on our web page. All right. Now we're going to do that, and I am going to talk about this stuff. I'll do it in the order they show it. All right. But when we get into talking about functions, I'm going to go back and still do it the old fashioned way because there's something that I want to show you ab about what's happening in there. So you will see it. I'm going to create my own example. I just literally thought of it right before class started. So I'm going to try something. I don't have any notes or anything, but we'll see how it goes. It should be all right. So we'll get the intro to objects. You can see there are several kinds of objects in JavaScript. JavaScript is what I refer to, and I may or may not have mentioned this previously. It is not an object-oriented programming language. Like those of you who took C sharp last semester or will take C sharp in summer. Rather, JavaScript is what I refer to as an object based programming language. The difference is you have total object oriented features in JavaScript, but you never have to use any of them. And really, for more, we're not going to use any of them. There is a chapter, I don't know, it's in the last part of the book that talks about object oriented. So we'll talk about it at that time. All right. But we will get into functions. And you know, I always you know try to at least when we start to, to talk about things that are somewhat new, try to give you an analogy that's not um that's not really related to computers. And with functions, I'll always remember this because many years ago, all right, um I was living at uh, at home and I wanted to get out of the house for a lot of reasons. So I moved in with my brother who had uh, a duplex. Well, that didn't work out real well either. So I was working at the time at a food store and that was back in the days when you had to go and, and take your produce and put it on a scale and weigh it, et cetera. And I was working in the produce department and I was talking to a gentleman. We'd become friends. I don't know how he was an older guy. And uh, I had told him about my frustrations, and he said that he literally had a little house behind his house. He called it his dollhouse. He said it was one bedroom, and it had a living room, it had a kitchen, and it had a bathroom. And then there was actually a shower, but that was in the basement. And he wasn't currently renting it. Did I want to rent it? So I looked at it. Long story short, I rented it. What does this have to do with functions? Well, there were times, literally, I was working three jobs and I was going to school. So there were times when I would come home and I would be like, this this house is just a mess. I got to clean it up, even though it wasn't big. But I said, I just don't have it in me. 
So what would I do? I would kind of trick myself and I'd say, you know what? Let's just break it down. Let's just clean the kitchen. And I'd clean the kitchen and it would look pretty good. Now let's go clean the bathroom. And I'd clean the bathroom and it would look pretty good. Now let's go clean the bedroom. But the point is, what I was doing was I was taking a job and rather than looking at it as one job, I broke it up into four or five smaller jobs that collectively did what I wanted them to do. And that's kind of what you do with functions. Now, I'm going to show you all the things that they mention here with functions. That said, because you're just learning it, after I show you how to use some, use some of these more grandiose features that you probably are, they're a little bit more advanced, I'll show you the way I would recommend that for now you do it. All right. Then finally, as it says there, we'll get into handling events. What does that mean? That means when they talk about attaching an event handler to an event, quite often it's, as an example, clicking a button. So if I click a button, I want to have some code run. And that's the kind of thing we're going to look at, especially when we get to these two uh, illustrative applications, the miles per gallon, which is now going to be GUI. All right, a lot more GUI than it was. And the email list app, which already was GUI, but we'll look at that as well. All right, so with all that said, now, when they talk about objects, okay, I'm just going to give you a couple definitions here. You don't have to re remember them or anything else. But as I mentioned, JavaScript is an object-based language. What that means is if you want to, you can create in JavaScript what are called classes. All right. And a class is a blueprint for what you want things to look like. As an example, imagine that a builder buys a big tract of land and decides that they're going to put 100 houses up on up on that tract of land. All right, they've got enough room for 100 houses. Each house, let's say, can be on a half an acre. All right, so you know they've got streets and stuff and they've got to worry about, we don't care about that stuff. But what they decide to do is they bring in an architect and the architect comes up with five different house plans. All right. And with these hundred houses, let's say there, there's going to be house one, two, three, four, five, then another row of one, two, three, four, five. And the architect comes up with five different house plans. Each one of those plans would be a house class. And each time you create a house based off of one of those plans, it would be a house object. All right. And as they say there, an object is a collection of methods that do actions and properties that contain data. Well, let's break away from the house for a minute and talk about, you know, we're all humans. We're all members of the human class. So we're all human objects or person objects. We all have things that we do. We eat, we drink, we sleep, etc. And we all have different properties that relate to us. We have eye color, hair color, gender, etc. So what they say there is we've already started to talk about some of this stuff. All right, we talked a little bit about the document object when we did the document dot write. We talked a little bit about the window object, which is the default object in JavaScript. And if you remember, gave you an example that rather than just saying alert, if we wanted to, we could say window dot alert. All right, and they mention here it says, the objects in JavaScript are divided into two main categories. The first consists of host objects, which are basically environmental objects. All right. And again, they mention the ones that we've already talked about, those being the window and the document. And the second, as it says, they're native or built in objects. And they're things that were provided when the European Computer Manufacturer Association or created JavaScripts, there was JavaScript rather, it was some of the things that they provided. There's an array object, there's a date object, there's a math object, there's a bunch of different objects. All right. Okay, and it says generally you don't need to know the difference between, you know, these different types of objects, but just to know that they all do exist. So the ones we've talked about so far really have just been the first two on that, on that uh, top table. We haven't talked about the navigator object 
And what the navigator object has is there are things in there like um, the operating system you might be running under, the browser that you're using, the version of the browser you're using, et cetera. All right, then there's a history where you can typically go back and forth and see what somebody has looked at, literally their browser history. All right, so as it says, those are some of the host objects. And then there's a bunch of other ones. And you'll notice that when we talk about number and string and Boolean, they all say that they're wrapper objects. And basically what a wrapper object does is it allows you to take a simple data type, all right, like a string or a Boolean or a number and treat it as though it is not a simple data type, as though it's an object. And if you say, do I have to even worry about this? The answer is no, all right? But I'm just trying to show you and talk to you about a couple of things that are in here. All right. Now, again, don't want to read to you, but take a look at what's in here, because as I've said to you several times, a lot of people don't like to read with these books. They don't like to read all the text on the left, but look at the code on the right or the tables on the right or the examples on the right and read these description because these descriptions, because typically they're summaries of what they've talked about in here, all right? They do mention down towards the bottom here that the math object is a utility object. And what they're saying there basically is you can use the math object to do a lot of mathematical operations that you could do yourself, but it would be harder to do. Case in point, if I want the square root of let's say 345, all right, I can go and write my own code to do that, and it might be several lines. Or I can say math.sqrt and then put in parentheses 345. And if I assign that to something, it's going to give me the answer. Much easier. All right, so that's a bunch of built-in stuff. So the first thing they talk about in here are the, is the window object. And if we take a look, this confirm statement we have not used before. All right, we have used the prompt to get input. We have used the alert to give output. But the confirm is when you look at it, here's the code. All right, are you sure you want to delete this item? Unlike what we've seen before, when you basically just have, you know, like, I don't know, a yes or a no or whatever, this in here, you can literally, if you want to, you can put code in that not only checks to see whether or not they clicked OK, but you can also put code in to see whether or not they clicked cancel. All right. So this literally, as it says, is a confirmation type of dialogue. All right. So if somebody, this is a good example. If somebody says, you know, are you sure you want to delete this? All right. I mean, typically, if you don't know this, that that usually one of the commands when you when you go to delete something, if you go to delete a whole folder or to, to you know even emptying your your uh, inbox, etc., typically the system will come back and it'll say, "Are you sure you want to do this?" And it might be yes, no. It might be okay, cancel or whatever. That's that's an example of a confirm, and that's what they're talking about in here. All right, the parse int and the parse float. We've talked about those before. I don't think that really pays to go over it any more than we than we already have. All right. And as it says, because the window object is global, you can omit it. We could have said window.parse int, window.parse float, or window.confirm, but it's just extraneous code that really there's no reason to put it in there. All right. Okay. So next is the document object. And as already mentioned, Next week, we'll be, we'll, we will be going over chapter six. So some of the stuff you're going to see right now, we will talk about in more depth and breadth of coverage when we get to chapter six. But they talk about the document object here. And notice it says it's the highest object in the DOM structure. DOM is an acronym for document object model. As it says, it basically represents every HTML element that you put on a page. And one of the keys to being able to harness the power of JavaScript is to be able to use the DOM. 
All right, so we're going to start looking at it right now. Now you'll notice that the table that we're going to see in just a minute on the next page has three different methods in it. All right, there's one called query selector. There's one called query selector all. All right, and the other one, I don't know if they're going to put it in here now or not. Let's see. Oh, it's just going to be right. Okay. But uh, we're going to look at another one in, in chapter six. But let's suppose that I wanted to look at and find the first paragraph that was in a document. All right. So it's an HTML file, and I want the first paragraph. I can do a query selector like that, and I can check inside of quotes for P for a paragraph. That'll find the first paragraph, all right, that's in the document. That's query selector. If I want to be able to grab every paragraph of the document, rather than query selector, I can choose query selector all. And as it says, it returns an array of objects that represents everything. So they start to give some examples in here because that may or may not make sense to you. The document.write we've looked at a little bit where you can write something right to the web page. All right. So notice what they have common ways to code selectors. All right. So the first example they have right there is they say document.query selector. Then notice it says pound rate. All right. So what that is looking for is whatever is in that document that has an ID of rate. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's a if it's a paragraph that has that NH1 tag, it doesn't matter. All right. But it's going to take that object and it's going to basically return it and put it into a variable called rate. The key takeaway here is when you're using query selector, and you're using or query selector all. If you're looking for IDs, you need to preface it with a pound sign. If you're looking for classes, you need to preface it with an error sign. If you're looking for elements, it's the name of the element. So for instance, this is going to return all anchor elements in an array that's that's there. All right. And you can do different things with these two. They show you a couple in the bottom, these bottom three here. All right. So it has here, notice pound facts, FAQS space H2. That says don't return all, all H2s, but return all H2s that are under an ID of facts. All right. Then you can combine them and they show some other ones in here and have multiple selectors. So there's a lot of different ways these things can be used. If that confuses you, please don't let it bother you because again, in my opinion, this is just an intro. We're really going to go into this in much more depth and breadth of coverage when we get to chapter six. All right, okay. Then next, hey, you know what these are already? But you have to remember that when, when the author comes in here in this book and talks about a text box, all right, or talks about a text box that can hold a number, for example, something like that, the people who write this book have no idea how much HTML background you have, all right? They don't know that the people who are looking at this book from Rankin Technical College have already gone through their other book, for example, all right. So as it says, the text box object represents the text box on a web page. All right. Most of the time when you talk about a text box itself, a regular text box, you're talking about something where the input type equal text. In other words, it can hold anything. On the other hand, when we use a number, it can only hold numbers. All right. If we if we set it up for type equal email, it can only hold email addresses, et cetera. All right, so let's take a look at the examples that they give here. The first thing that they talk about here is focus. 
And all focus means is it's typically when you you're talking about focus, typically you're talking about being having a forum on a page and it's whatever field the cursor is currently in. All right, that's the field that has the focus. And you may or may not remember, but when we have been setting up, all right, for example, last, you know, a little earlier in the semester, when we worked with forms, we would put a label in there and we would say four equals, F-O-R equals, and we'd have the name of our text box in there. And the reason for that is if you click on the actual label, then it puts the focus on that form element that's connected to it. All right, you can do select, which as it says, will highlight everything. Typically it'll be in blue. All right, highlights everything that's in the text box. All right, there's a couple of other ones. Value is going to become really, really important. Because we're gonna be using these things and we're gonna be using these things with the, like the name of the text box dot value. And that's going to give us, as it says, the contents of that text box, which are a string by default, even if it's a number in there. All right, we can enable or disable what's in a text box. Some people get confused. That doesn't mean that it's visible or invisible. That means if it's disabled, you can't literally give it the focus. You can't click on it and make it active. It's disabled. All right. The two fixed we've already looked at, so there's nothing new in there. I do want to mention when you look at this here, it says let first name equal document dot query selector and then first name. Then notice first name equal first name dot value. So we're setting first name here equal to, all right, whatever has whatever has the ID of first name, right? But what we want in there, that's going to return everything. We just want its value. So we want whatever is in, that's probably going to end up being an input box or a text box. Also notice, because this is called chaining. Why? because here it's the name of the object, the property. Here it's the name dot, or it's the type of object dot something dot something else. Especially when we get to chapters eight through 11 and we start talking about jQuery, jQuery is infamous for chaining. Sometimes you'll have this dot this dot this dot this. The key takeaway, the key thing to remember is always go from left to right. So we're in the document object. We're going to use the query selector to give us something with an idea first name. Then we're going to grab its value. All right. OK. And again, they've got some stuff in here using chaining and not using chaining. If that confuses you for these next few chapters, we're going to be doing virtually nothing with these. All right, and I, I shouldn't even say virtually, I, I shouldn't say nothing, but the amount that we're going to do with working with chaining and the like is going to be minimal. It'll become more active, so to speak. When we go through chapter six, starting next week, and then following that, when we get into chapters eight, nine, 10, and 11 with jQuery. All right, as it says there, when you store a number or a string in a variable or a constant, it's automatically converted to that kind of object when you use a method on it. What the heck does that mean? Let's look at the example. All right. A real common one is what they show there. Secondly, const today equals new date. All right. If I did that right now, then today would hold literally Wednesday 3 15 2023 and it would be like 8 30 a.m because by default a date object has the date information and the time information so if you want you can grab anything out of there you want to grab out of there so they show you some examples all right and I'm not going to run through any of those 
Okay, but you'll notice that these examples that are down here with the date object or the ones here, all right, that three of those examples in that table use the word get. And notice when you use the word get like that, all right, it's returning something. So you cannot change a value when you use the word get. It's called an accessor. All right, it's like you walk into class the first day and I say, what's your name? And you say, Grant. All right, I am getting your first name. If I turn around and said, well, we already have three grants in here, so you're going to be called John. That would be a set as opposed to a get. So a get, you are grabbing a value. With a set, you are setting a value. That may not be all that appropriate right now, but we are going to be getting into that. All right, when you work with things like strings, we're going to have a whole chapter later on strings. What's a string? Anything inside of double quotes or single quotes. All right, so if I put my name, if I say uh, let first name equal double quote, J-E-F-F, -F, double quote, and then I ask for the name dot length, it's going to come back with four, J-E-F-F, -F, there's four characters. There's a lot of other things that you can do with a string object. And guess what? We've already looked at the bottom one in that particular table. We did that two upper case when we were working, you know, when we asked the user if they wanted to run the program again. And then we were checking to see if the first character upper cased was a Y. All right. And, you know, again, we're going to be talking about this in later chapters. They give you some examples in here. All right, so you can use the date to work with date objects. You can use the string to work with string objects. There are, you know, basically virtually any type that's in here you can use and you can have it work, you know, on different things. All right, now how to use functions. I'm going to jump out for just a second and I'm going to write something. Like I said, hopefully I'm not going to uh, be sorry that I'm doing this, but I, I, I just wanted to try something here. I'm going to make this real simple little thing here that's going to be called calculator, and it's going to be maybe the world's worst calculator. All right, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to open it with code. All right, and do what we always do, and that is I'm going to put in an index.html and hit my tab key. No, hit my tab key. Uh, exclamation point tab. All right, so we're going to call this simple calculator all right so we've got that then we're going to come in and add a css folder and we will put it a file in here called our styles dot there that is and we will put in another folder here that we're going to call js and inside of the js we're going to put in our file it's called scripts.js. All right, just to make sure if I close that, yep, that looks good. Yep, that looks good. Good. All right. So going back to the index, I'm going to very quickly add my link statement, and that'll be CSS slash styles.css. And in here, we are going to add our script tag. OK, so we've got all that. Now, this is all stuff we've done before. There's nothing new here, but this is what I'm going to do. All right. And there, believe me, if you just trust me for a couple minutes, there's a reason I'm doing this and there's a reason I'm doing it in the way I'm doing it. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say let. I'm just going to call it num1 equal and let me close this so I've got a little bit more room to work with. And I'm going to say parse int prompt. Enter a number. All right. And again, you've seen all this kind of stuff before. All right. Now we'll check. So if is NAN num1. In fact, let's do it the way we've been doing it. So we'll just say while it's not a number. OK. We're just going to ask you to do it again. All right, that's that's fine. So that's a start. And I'm going to go right below it. 
and I'm going to put num2 here. So let's change this to enter number one. And we'll change this again. So it says enter number one. And then this one will be enter number two. All right. Now that's not doing much except it allowed us to add in two numbers. So I'm going to say this. Let sum equals num1 plus num2. All right. After I get done with that, I'm going to do an alert. And I'm going to say, in fact, let's let's use our, our template literals and I'll put in here. Um, dollar sign num1 plus dollar. I need the dollar sign. So dollar sign num1 plus dollar sign num2. Equal. Dollar sign sum. OK, no biggie right there, no surprise or anything, but let's let's do this. And I'm doing it about five times. I'm going to make a bunch of changes in here and I'm going to call this diff. And that'll be number one minus number two. All right. And here we will use a minus sign. All right. And then here we'll call this product prod for product and it'll be number one times number two and again we'll put that in all right now the only you know, we shouldn't have to worry about anything you know we've we know we've got numbers in here however if we do q u o t for quotient whoops let me do that all right javascript is a little unique that if I divide by zero, it literally gives me the number infinity. All right, it literally will say that the answer is infinity. Okay, but I don't want to do that. So rather than saying let quote equal this, all right, I'm going to say right here, let quote equal num1 divided by num2. I don't like that. So I'm going to come in here and say if num2 equal equal zero all right so if that number two is equal to zero i'm going to say let quote equal illegal divide by zero and i'm not gonna that's that's all i'm gonna do and i'll do an alert later all right i'm gonna say else then i'm gonna grab this statement right here and tell it to do this. All right, but now it's either going to say so if I put a zero in there and I don't want this to be sum. Did I leave all those as sum? I foolishly did. So that is sum. This should be diff. This should be prod. And this should be QUOT. Here. And we're going to do the last one in just a moment. All right. In fact, this is going to basically be repeated from what we just did. So let me grab that and put it down here. All right. So now we've got this. We've we've done the sum, the difference, the product, and the quotient. All right. So I'm going to call this one the mod because we're going to do a modulo. All right. And that'll be a modulo. And that'll be a modulo. All right. And this will be not quote. This will be mod. And we only, we can only say let mod once. All right. So that is gonna not going to work right. So let's fix that. All right. And this will also say mod. Now, what am I doing? Besides, you might think wasting your time. Well, if I come in here, Hopefully in just a second, if I come in here and I put in for number one, I'm going to do it like this. I'll put in a 17 and it'll take it right away and it'll say enter number two and I'm going to put in five. Then it should add 17 and five and say 17 plus five equal 22. Then it should take 17 minus five 
and say 17 minus 5 equals 12. Then it should take 17 and multiply it by 5 and say 17 times 5 equal 85. Then it'll check here, is num20? It's not. All right, so it should say quote equals 17 divided by 5, and we'll get the alert here, and let's do it to two decimal places. So that's two fixed to two decimal places. All right, and then finally, it'll say again, is number two zero. It's not, so it should do the modulus. So 17 divided by five is three with a remainder of two. So it should say two when we do this. Let's see, first of all, if that even works. So file, save all, go back to here. Let's run this. All right, so there's 17 and there's five. So 17 plus five is 22. 17 minus five is 12. 17 times five is 85. 17 divided by five to two decimal places is 3.40. And 17 modulo five is two. No surprise there. All right, that really works pretty much the way you think it would. And if we do it again, and I'll say 23 here, and I'll use a zero here. All right, well, 23 and zero is 23, still 23, it's zero. All right, now it doesn't like it. So what doesn't it like? All right, it says quote is not defined. So let's make sure it was. <clears throat> Let quote. All right, actually, it doesn't like this because I'm defining quote in here, so it's only known in between here and here. It's not known outside of here, so I can come in here and do another let here and another let here. All right, I can do that. I think that's all I have to fix that. So let's check. So again, I'll do a save all and I'm going to run it again. And again, we use 23 and 0, 0, 23, 0. Still doesn't like it, so what doesn't it like now? All right, it says quote is not defined on line 31. Well, let's look. Okay, there's the problem. It's known here inside up until that curly brace. It's known here, but only inside of that curly brace. So what I have to do is up at the top of my program for those two variables. All right, in fact, I can do it all. Let me do this. I'm going to say here, let sum, and we can say equals zero. Let diff equals zero. Let quote equals zero. Those errors are going to be all gone in just a second. Let uh, prod, I think it was, equal zero. And finally, let mod equals zero. All right, and you'll notice that I've got a bunch of errors now. Well, let's go in and fix those errors right away. All right, we don't need the word let anymore because we already did this. Now it should all work the way we want it to. Now, unless I missed it and put a left a let in here, it should now be working. So again, let's use what we did before to make sure we didn't break that. So 17 and 5, 17 plus, minus, multiply, divide, all right, and modulo. Now, I should put this in a loop, but I didn't. So we'll run it one more time, 23 and 0, plus, minus multiply still doesn't like something so let's figure out what it doesn't like quote dot two fixed is not a function well 
Well, I don't know why it wouldn't like that, but we'll just remove that and we'll just use quote. That's fine. All right, and we'll re remove it there. We didn't even use it down. We don't need it down there anyway, so. All right, illegal divide and illegal divide. That's what I wanted. Good. All right, so why did I waste your time doing all that? There's a reason I wasted your time doing that, because hopefully at least I didn't waste your time. All right. What I want to do now is rather than write this the way that it's written, I want to take and break this into its own unit. I want to break this into its own unit. I want to break this into its own unit, this into its own unit, and then finally this into its own unit. So I'm going to write some more code down here. All right. So what am I going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is <clears throat> there's not to confuse you, but I'm going to show you two ways of doing this. All right. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, I'm going to write a bunch of routines. It won't like this right now, but I'm going to call um, calculate this sum equals calculate sum. Jeez. Paren, paren. Okay. And then the next thing that we're going to do in just a moment is we're going to call, we're going to say diff equals calculate diff. All right. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to say prod equal calculate prod. And then after that, all right, we're going to, you get the idea. So let's grab this code and take it out of here. Right there. So I've got sum equal. So now down here, I'm going to write this. I'm going to write function sum. All right, now I've got this code, the same code we had before. All right, where I can, now I can say, let and num1 equal, you know, do this, et cetera. All right, and do the same thing with num2. Now, do I really want to do this five times? Do I really want to read in five different numbers? The answer, in my, for me, no. I want to do it once. So I'm going to write another routine here that's called input number one. All right, and another one that's called input number two. All right, and up here, I'm going to create two more variables. So I'm going to say let num1 equals zero and let num2 equals zero. All right, so now I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say num1 equal input number one. All right, and then we're going to say num2 equals input number two. All right, I know this looks like a, a big mess, but just bear with me for a second, if you would, please. All right, so now this thing that we just put in here, that thing right there, that's going to become, okay, input number one. Okay, so we're going to say here, let num one equal, you know, tell them to enter a number, put it into a while loop. All right. And we can be sure now when they get out of here, it's going to be a number. All right, so now we're going to type in here, return num1. Now, uh, you're going to hear me say this many times in your career here at Rankin, but play computer. All right, so what we're doing is when the system comes to right here, it gives up control so it jumps from line nine all the way down to line 53, because right here, this is called a function call. We are calling a function. And whatever that function returns, we're gonna stuff it into num1, all right? 
So what is happening then? We are creating a new variable. We don't have to call it num1. You know, we can call it just, we can call it number, for example, totally fine. And we can just change this to enter a number. And this one as well. We can give it a default if we want, but we don't have to. All right, so this again will become number. Oops. So will this. And so will this. So what we're doing is we are writing functions. And what that is going to allow us to do is transfer control in our program to different places. Now, you'll notice here that I call this input number one and I call this input number two. That's two different routines, but hopefully you've already realized I'm doing the same thing both times. So why should I have two routines, one called input number one and one called input number two? We can just come in here and create a routine, all right, and that routine is called input number. And I can call it the first time and it'll say enter a number. Then I call it again and it'll enter another number. So again, it, the, the system goes through and it does all this stuff. Then it says, okay, num1 equals input number. It goes down to line 53 and it does those four or five lines and it returns number, which I stuff into here. Then I call it again and it goes down to line 53 again. It does those five or six number lines. It returns number and I stuff that into here. All right. So what I'm doing is I am starting to do what's called modularizing my program. Now, I don't need that in there anymore. Any place where I had come in and, you know, said enter number one or enter number two, this can all be removed now. All right. So the next thing I want to do is I want to say sum equal calculate sum. So again, I'm going to grab this. And I'm just going to grab that one line that you see right there. All right, sum equal num1 plus num2. I'm going to grab that line and I'm going to go down here and I'm going to write another function that's called calculate sum. And all I'm going to do right there is just return what? Well, those two numbers. Okay, now. I just want to return number one or num one plus num two. That's really all I want to do right here. Okay, so return num one plus num two. All right, and that'll get me back up to here. So now I want to do this and I want to say diff calculate or calc calculate diff. And I'm going to remove that. And right under calculate sum, I'm going to have function calculate diff. And in there, I'm going to return num1 minus num2. All right. So now I've got that done. And my next one I want to do in here so I can get rid of all that. And now I want to call calculate prod. So I'm going to come down here again and write another function. And I'm going to return num1 times num2. All right. So now I can come back up here and I've got all those done. And now what's left? Well, I have to calculate the quotient and I have to calculate the modulus, all right? I could actually combine those and put those into one routine. It would take a little work, but I could do that. I'm not going to. I'm gonna grab all this code here. Oops, not like that, I'm not. All right, so I'm gonna grab that. Now I'm gonna say here, quote, equal, calculate, quote. All right, and I'm gonna come down here and put another function in, which is calculate quote. 
All right, and I'm going to paste this in and I'll say if num2 equals zero, quote equals a legal divide, whoops, else, quote equals, and then actually do the division. Now I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say return quote. All right, and then finally, because I've got one more to go, I'm going to come down here and say mod equal calculate mod. All right. And again, I can grab all of this code. I don't need these alerts anymore. You'll see why in a moment. And now I'm going to come down here and I'm going to have another function that's called calculate mod. All right. And down at the bottom, I'm going to say return mod. All right. So now what I have done is I've got, for example, technically I've got here what you call like a main type of a program. We're going to give it another name in just a bit. All right, but here I'm inputting the first number. Here I'm inputting the second number. Here I'm calculating the sum. Then I'm calculating the difference. Then I'm calculating the product. Then I am calculating the quotient. Then I am calculating the modulus. All right, so let me give me a second here. I'm going to grab that line. And now I'm going to say show all results. OK, and after that, show all results, that'll be another function that'll be down here. So function show all results. All right, and let me put that in there. All right, so what do I want to do? So I want to say num1 plus num2 equals sum num1 minus num2 that equals if num1 times num2 that equals rod num1 divided by num2 and that equals the quotient and what we already have all right so what you see in here, basically what you see is what I've done is I'm modularizing the program. Now, you might look at that and say you made it worse. I'm going to tell you why it's better. If I end up having some kind of a problem where down here, my sum is incorrect, and it's like I put in 12 and 15, and it came back with some stupid number that was now I know that that error has to be inside of here. So when you modularize a program like this, what you're doing is you're breaking the program out into different segments. Like I told you how I like to go in, and when I was I had to clean my house, broke it up into a bunch of different rooms. Let's see if I if it works or if I screwed it up. Again, we'll just take something simple, 17 and 5. All right, so 17 plus 5, 17 minus 5, 17 times 5, 17 divided by 5, 17 modulo 5. It all appears to work. All right, let's run it one more time and put the 0 in there. So 23, I think we used, and 0. All right, and it's all working, okay? Now, we're going to take a break in just a minute, but again, what I'm trying to impress upon you is when you get a program, and this is actually a really simple program, you can tell we're just reading in two numbers and adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and doing a modulo, and it's not even a long program, all right? It's what, 80 lines, 
but we've already taken it and broken it down. So rather than it being 80 lines, all right, that's one routine from top to bottom, we have basically converted it into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different routines. And each routine has a job to do. When you write functions, a function ideally should do one and only one thing. Now, do people break that rule all the time? The reason I'm telling you that is imagine for a moment, you ask someone to enter a first name, a last name, an address, a city, a state, a zip code, a cell phone number, and an email address. That's eight fields. Technically, you put into eight different routines. Now, most people wouldn't do that. They'd put it all into one routine. But I'm telling you, when you truly are modularizing, which is what I'm trying to show you here, all right, there's a job for everything, okay? Now, it's 9.01. Let's take a break. It's just about 9.02. So we'll take a break and come back at 9.12. Then I'm going to go back into the book, all right? So I'll see you in 10 minutes.
All right, it is 912, so I'm going to continue on. I'm on page 134, and we're talking about using functions. Now, I don't disagree with what the author says there about when you develop JavaScript apps, you need to handle events. That's true. But virtually in any programming language, a program breaks down into a series of things that are going to happen and how you react or how the program reacts to those things happening. All right. And that's basically why you write functions. So you can modularize or take a problem and break it into a series of smaller problems, for lack of better words. All right. Now, as it says there, a function is a block of statements that ideally performs a single action. You can pass information in to a function. I didn't show you that. We'll look at that in a little bit. All right. When you pass information in, what you pass into a function, it's, it's typically called either a parameter or an argument. You'll see both of them. All right. Functions can return things. The program I just wrote, every function we had in there returned something. To code a function declaration, as they mentioned right there, you start with the keyword function, followed by the name of the function, followed by parentheses. In those parentheses, you can pass in things. That's where your parameters or, you are, or your arguments go, or you can pass in nothing. But regardless, you need the set of parameters or the set of parentheses. If you don't put them in, if you don't put in a set of parentheses, it doesn't think it's a function. It thinks it's a variable. All right. Now, it says we recommend that you use function names that consists of verbs and nouns. That's not that important. What is important is functions in an ideal world should only consist of letters. You shouldn't have any words. I'm sorry, you shouldn't have any numbers in a function. Um, you may have to for whatever reason, but you, you can't have special characters in there. And there's all sorts of recommendations. You saw some of them when we looked at some of the stuff for the built-in methods that we saw in JavaScript, like to string or this or that, or get, get full date or get full year, etc. All right. Now, when you call a function it's also known as a function invocation you put the name of the function in there and if you want to call the function and the function needs parameters or arguments you pass them into the function so we'll look at their examples in just a moment all right now one of the examples that they give is probably going to seem confusing even even for those of you who have gone through the C-sharp class, because it doesn't look like anything we've done before. So the syntax for the function is shown there on page 135. The word function, followed by the name of the function, followed by a set of parentheses. In those parentheses, you may have zero or more parameters or arguments. And sometimes people get confused with parameter or argument. I mean, like, what the heck is that? Well, let's go back to the example I gave you before. And that example, uh, that non-computer example, when I talked about cleaning my house, what if I write some kind of a generic method 
that's called clean room. But in so so it would be function, clean room. But in here, I need to tell it what room to clean. Because for instance, I don't clean the bathroom the same way that I clean the bedroom. All right. Because for the bedroom, I'd have to make the bed and et cetera, et cetera. For the bathroom, I'd have to clean the toilet, clean the sink. All right. So that's what parameters are. They're information that a function may need in order to get its job done. So this example right here is a function, this show year, and that show year has no parameters. It doesn't require anything. So all it should say, if we ran this right now, if we were to run this, write this and then run it, it should say the year is 2023. All right, that's what should happen. This right here is the function call or the function invocation. You are invoking or calling the function. All right, now hopefully at least that stuff made sense. This is where it may get a little squirrely. If you look at this example here that says a function declaration with one parameter that returns a DOM element, it's like, what the heck is that? All right. What you are writing here in this example that you see right near the top of the screen is what I like to refer to as an alias. So if you write that at the top of your program and I type in there dollar sign and I put into that dollar sign, I don't know. Let, let's just say I've got in there dollar sign and I put in there pound sign or uh, I'm sorry, double quote, a double quote. So I write this. And then I put in here dollar sign. Double quote, a double quote. It's a shortcut. It's as though I wrote in document dot query selector, double quote, a double quote. So what we're doing right here is we're saying we want to use the dollar sign as a shortcut for writing document.query selector. It's oft times done because it results in a lot less typing. Do you have to do that? Of course not. You could do the document.query selector every time. You could do that. All right. But this is, results in a lot less typing that you have to do. All right. Then we've got a function declaration here with two parameters and it returns a value. Passing in sum total, and we're passing in tax rate. And then we are multiplying one by the other to get the tax, and we're returning that tax, tax rather. And then you can see how you can call it down below. So you can read this stuff, but I think we've gone over it. All right, now, fortunate, unfortunate, however you wanna call it, JavaScript is very, very unique amongst most other programming languages because you can do some very special things in JavaScript that you cannot do in almost any other programming language. I want to say that again. JavaScript is unique in that you can do some things in JavaScript that you cannot do in most other programming languages. And the bottom line is, because we're going to look at some examples, it all boils down to one thing. JavaScript allows you to create a function and treat the function like it was a variable. Again, I want to say that again. JavaScript allows you to create a function and use that function as if it was a variable. I don't know of any other language that allows you to do it the way that JavaScript does. When you do that, all right, when you assign a value to a function, all right, or if you take the function and you assign it to something, it's called a function expression. And we're going to look at that in just a minute, but it's all explained in here. All right. I don't want to sit there and, and confuse you by going over all this talk. All right. I'd rather show you the examples that they show in here. All right. So let's look at them. Look at the show year 
this one. Let's just look at this one for now, right there. And let's compare this with this. We had function show year, paren, paren, then in curly braces, const today equal new date, alert the year is today dot get full year. All right. So remember the first line there, the function show year. Now we've got show year equal function. And then the body of it is exactly the same as what we saw before. But what we're doing now is we're creating a functional expression and we are assigning, we are assigning the return or the, really we are assi assigning the function to the variable called show year. And you'll notice we're still calling it the same way. And you might say, well, what? I don't get it. What's the advantage of doing that? In many cases, there'll be no advantage at all. But one of the things that JavaScript tries to do as much as it can is to be all things to all people. And what I mean by that is it allows you to oft times do the same thing in multiple different ways. Do you ever have to use a function expression? Really, you don't. All right. Is it, does that make more sense than doing it the other way? To some people, yes. To other people, no. Again, you are just getting introduced to this stuff. All right, so if, if function expressions or some of the other stuff we're gonna look at in just a bit, arrow functions and, and the like, if they don't make a lot of sense to you right now, please don't use them, all right? But what you will notice is over time, as you start to write more and more complex code, you will be using them, right? And that's just, that's a statement of fact. It's not something that I'm making up. It's just the way that it is. So what they're trying to do here in this book is as much as possible, all right, they are trying to show you as much stuff as they can possibly show you in here. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll let you decide, all right? So I don't want to go any further on it than that. And read this stuff, but it's just another way you can write a regular standard type of function like I showed you, and then you can write them as functional expressions. All right, what I will do later today, not right now, but later today, if I have time, is I'm going to take the code that I've already written. I'm going to put that out there. All right, but I'm going to rewrite it so you'll have one where I one with function expressions so you can see both of them in action, so to speak. All right. All right, the next one then is an arrow function. It's another shortcut. Now, I will tell you, Grant and Chad, and there's, there's a handful of you who took the class last semester, the AWD 1100 C Sharp class. If you took that class last semester, then you are scheduled this summer to take the AWD 1111 class with Mr. Gudmisted. And that class is database driven web website development. All right. The reason I'm telling you that is that is writing JavaScript on the server, not on the client. The reason I'm telling you that is that virtually everything that you end up doing in that class, whenever possible, you will use arrow functions. An arrow function or an arrow operator, as they call it, is an equal sign followed immediately by a greater than sign. It's basically looked at as being one character. So if we take a look at the examples in here, because it's a little confusing. All right. So when you look here, what they're saying is it's a shortcut, another one of these shortcuts. What does that mean? Well, look at these two examples that they're showing here, actually all three examples, where they're showing calculating tax. 
the first one, all right, where it says const calculate tax. Well, where did const come from? Well, remember, we're now treating calculate tax, even though it's a function, all right, we're taking the function and assigning it to a variable. And a variable should have const or let in front of it. So we're putting const there, all right? So when you look at the second example, we have rewritten that using an arrow function. And when you look at it, you may like, okay, I'm looking here, what's different? Oh, we removed the word function and we replaced it with a equal sign followed by a greater than sign, right? That's basically all the difference is, all right? And you look at the third one, you're like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't look the same. Yeah, if you don't have any parameters, you don't need when you do it this way. So if you use an arrow function and you don't have any parameters, you can just leave the paren paren out. All right. Now, do I expect that to make sense? No. I will tell you that when I learned this stuff, I took all my functions and I wrote them the first way that I showed you. I didn't worry about function expressions. I didn't worry about arrow statements or arrow expressions. I just wrote them. All right. And next semester, as I mentioned, you're going to write stuff that's going to look like this and like this. That doesn't mean you can't still do it like this. You can. But it's just that it results in less code. That's all. All right. I don't want to go through it any more than that because I don't want to confuse anybody. All right. But I'm going to jump back into my code for a minute because it's going to allow me to talk about global scope, local scope, and block scope. I went back and I, I added a couple things to the program. All right. First, I put you strict up here. You didn't have to do that. But as I said, the reason we put you strict up there is that makes us become better programmers because some of the cheats, so to speak, that JavaScript lets you get away with, you can now not get away with anymore. So in my humble opinion, it makes you a better programmer. Now, these variables right here, I don't know, what are there, 10 of them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, what do you know? 10 of them. These 10 variables that you see in blue right now, they're known as global variables. What that means is they can be used anywhere in the, in the function, anywhere. We can use them anywhere in the function. They're available, and I shouldn't say in the function, anywhere in the program. They're global. They're available to anyone, everyone, et cetera. All right. If I took these, and I'm going to do that for right now, and I remove them, and I put them in right here. All right. So what did I do? I took them from where they were up here, and I moved them into here. But now these 10 variables are inside of a function. So when they're, when you create variables that are outside of any function, they're known as global variables. Their scope is global. They're known program-wide. When you take and you create variables inside of a function, they're known as local variables. And they're local to this function right here. Now, can I still use them? All right, yes. But notice that there's another way that I could have called this. So in other words, now, if I wanted to make sure that calculate sum had number one and had number two, as an example, if I wanted to make sure it had them, all right, I could pass num one and num two. In fact, I'd have to do that now. This I don't think is going to work since I made these local variables. I'm going to see right now if it works or not. I could be wrong. So I'm going to come in here. First number, 12, second number, four, and hit enter. And I'm getting an error. 
How do I know that? Because when I go to inspect and I go to console, all right, one error. It says num1 is not defined. And you're like, wait a minute. You just defined num1 right here. Yeah, but its scope where it's known is only inside of here. All right. So if I want to use num1 in here and num2, I'd have to pass in. I'd have to go num1, num2. And I'd have to do that for every one of these routines. All right. Now it's even worse because now show results, it's going to need some. In fact, it's going to need num1, num2, sum, diff, prod, quote, and mod. I don't know if it'll still work, but I'm going to try it. So file, save all, go back to here, and run this again. And we'll put in 12 and 5. Still giving me an error. What doesn't it like now? Num1 is not defined, and it's telling me it's at line 54. So let's see where that is. All right. And you're like, wait a minute, num1, num2. Yeah, guess what? Now I have to let them know that I passed in num1 and I passed in num2. Okay. So I have to now, since I passed them in up above, I've got to use them in here as well. Whoops. Try that one again. Now, hopefully I didn't skip anything, but we'll find out in a second. Okay, it still doesn't like something. Quote is not defined. So where was that? That was in line 75. All right, now I'm creating a variable called quote, and it doesn't know what, what the heck is quote. So now I have to come up here and say let quote equal zero and I've got to do it here because I'm manipulating it arithmetically and I wasn't previously and here I've got to say let mod equal zero let's see if that fixed everything I'm going to just use simple numbers so 12 and 5 still doesn't like something all right, num1 is not defined in line 99. Well, it's saying it doesn't like any of these. All right, why? We'll go and we make one more fix and hopefully that'll do everything. And that's because down here, like I said, now it needs to know num1, num2, sum, diff, rod, quote, and mod. It needs to know those. I need to pass them in. So save all. Let's try it one more time. 12 and 9. And there's 12 plus 9, 12 minus 9, 12 times 9, 12 divided by 9, and 12 modulo 9. I added the functionality and to run the program again. So if I say yes and I put in 55 and 7, it'll run again. Same kind of thing. And now I don't want to run it again. All right. Now, you might say to yourself, wow, you made a lot of errors in there. Did you do that on purpose? Most of them, believe it or not, yes. The reason for that is when we get done with this chapter, chapter five is on debugging. And I'm starting to show you how to debug. All right. Now, if I go back, in fact, I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take all of this that I have because it works. All right. And I'm going to grab every bit of that. And I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. All right. Then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make another file. And I'm just going to call it index2.html. So you can see the difference between them. And I'm going to paste this in, remove this now, and go back to the way we had it previously. And what I mean is 
I'm going to grab all these variables, all right, and I'm going to put them up on the top. Now, when I call these, I don't need to pass in anything. And what the reason for this is I'm showing you the difference between using global variables where you don't have to worry about passing anything and using local variables, all right, where you do have to pass things. So all these have to be changed now. So I have to remove these oops, from everywhere. So I just want empty parens. And all of that. So you can see the difference. All right. So you might say, I, I do see the difference. I'm just going to make everything global. When you make everything global, you can get what are called side effects. What a side effect is, sometimes you want to have side effects. Sometimes you don't want to have side effects. E-F-F-E-C-T-S. But what, when you have a side effect, what it is, is it's saying that any, any, any function in a program can change the value of a global variable, even ones that technically should not be allowed to change it. So if I came in here, I'm not going to do this, but if I came in here and right up above this, if I came in and I said num1 equals 55, num2 equals 55, it's going to return, it's going to return 110. So in calculate sum, all I should be doing is a calculation. All right, I shouldn't be allowed to, to, to go in and change it. But when you make things global, then everything can change it. When you make things local, it can change a copy. That's the difference. All right, when you pass, when you have things here that are global, and you work with them inside of a function, you have the actual value. Actually, you have the address and memory where the value lives. But when you make them local, like I showed you when I put them in here, the copy that you end up passing in. So you're only making changes to the copy, not the original. Now you'll notice too in here, I put in this. Like what the heck is that? Well, let's leave it out. So I'm going to comment this line here out. All right. That's in my, oh, wait a minute. That's, where am I? Oh, I shouldn't have called it. That should have been scripts too. Sorry. Let me change the name of that. So let me rename it. The whole thing to scripts2.js. All right. And we want to move it so it's underneath here. That was my error and I apologize. All right. So if I leave that out, in fact, I'll leave it out of both of them. All right. There's scripts and there's main. I'm just going to leave that line out. So I'm commenting that out. So I'm going to do a file, save all, and I'm going to come back and run the program. And my output will be there ain't nothing. Main is not being called because it's not executing that main routine, that main function, because I'm never calling it, all right? And you'll, you'll notice this as we go on in here, there's ways around that, but from what we've been doing in here so far, we need, whether it's this one or whether it's this one, we need to actually call main, all right? This main that's right here, th there's, it's, so the word main is not anything special to JavaScript. We could have called it Ralph, and the program would have worked fine. Except when we call it in here, we would have had to have then said, uh, when we did it rather in here, that if we call that Ralph, then that would have to be Ralph. All right. But main is a keyword in many programming languages. It is what's referred to as the point of entry. In other words, it's where your code begins to execute. All right, so I call mine main. Main is also known as a driver. Ideally, you should be doing no executable code.
Maine. Maine should be like a supervisor, all right? Where a really good supervisor, it's not that they don't do any work, but they know whom to delegate authority to to get the work done in the best way possible. So what Maine is doing here is we're declaring variables, but then we're calling routines. Even this routine right here, this, all right? We could have written that as another routine and put that on the bottom here. That would have actually been cleaner because we are doing some actual code in here. Let's see, I don't know if I can do this, but we're gonna try it anyway. So I'm gonna do a control X right here to get rid of all that. And I'm gonna call uh, do again, all right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign run what did we call it up above here? Run again. So I'm going to call run again, and I'm going to set that equal to do again. Now, if I run the program now, I'm going to get an error because I don't have anything called do again. So I'm going to put in here function, do again. It doesn't require anything. So I'm going to put it in like this. So I'm going to say here, let again equal prompt. Do you want to run the program again? All right. And then again equals this. And then let that equals this if if it's uh, blah, blah, blah. if that's the case then i can return false otherwise and i don't need an else i can type in return true so what's going to happen is it should come down at the bottom of the program and again say run program again yes or no whatever i type in it should uppercase it then it should check the first character. If the first character I put in is not a Y, it'll return false. So false will go into run again. So it'll come up here to make the check, and since it's false, it'll fall out. If, on the other hand, I put in a Y for that first character, it'll come down here and return true. Let's see if I broke it or if it still works. And it looks like it still works. So now what's happened in here is main really is a driver. Other than creating those variables up here, all right? And again, remember, we don't have to do that. I can put them up here, all right? But now all main is doing is it's calling routines. It's taking the control of the program and it's giving it off to different functions. I remember that I had a boss years ago when I was teaching at a different school and it always seemed like to me like he wasn't doing anything. I mean, he's a good guy. I liked him. I still keep in contact with him today, but I always thought, what do you do? Then he went on vacation for two weeks during the middle of a semester and I found out what he did. Because a lot of stuff that was getting done behind the scenes wasn't getting done. All right. Okay. So let's jump back into our book. So I tried to show you their global scope and local scope. The other one is what's called, what do they call it here? Block scope. And that just means that something is only known between curly braces. And if you remember, I actually showed you that before when we had that quote equal and it didn't know it, what quote meant outside of the curly braces. We're gonna hit on all this stuff over and over again as we keep going. They mentioned in general, try to use local variables and not global. Again, to try to keep those side effects from happening. All right. Now, now we're going to, for lack of better words, really try to put it together and, uh, for again, for lack of better words, bring the HTML part back into this because JavaScript really shines when it works as an event handler, all right? So when it responds to click events, button click events, etc. So 
Some of these events are shown here. All right. The events are what are shown column. I'm not going to read them to you. You can see them. All right. But fortunately or unfortunately, it's going to get if, if you found the last stuff that we just went over to be confusing. Sorry, this is going to be more confusing. You really have to read the book for this to make sense. And if if you take the test next week, and Grant, you know I don't mean you, but if you take the test next week, you and if you have not written the read the book and none of it makes sense, sorry, I don't really have a lot of sympathy for you because they give you a lot of examples in here. All right. And this is what we're going to see. So I want to go over this example right here. Right there. Okay. And I'll put it right at the top there. What this assumes is that you have a button in your HTML and you have given that button an ID of submit underscore button. All right. What this line of code says is whenever that button is clicked, we want you to call the function called join list. I want to say it again. That's how you read this. This is adding an event listener, and in particular, it is adding a click listener to the button. The button is the button that has got an ID of submit button. All right. The click event says when you click the button with an ID of submit button, run the routine called join list, the function. Notice the join list does not have parentheses. You do not want parentheses there. If you put the parens there, it would literally call the function. We don't want it to call the function there. We are setting up an event handler. So when that event happens, we want to handle it. So that's what we're doing. And you can add event handlers to all this stuff, and there's a lot more. All right. Okay. Here they're doing it, but they're using a double click event as opposed to a click event. But they're saying now we've got a text box that's got an ID of text box one. So now we're saying call that same join list, but but do it when we double click something with an ID of text box one. All right. These are both attaching or adding event handlers. You can also remove an event handler. All right. And if, if this is confusing you, what we're going to look at after the break is we're going to look at the two examples in this chapter, the one with miles per gallon and the other one that has the, um, the mail list. And we'll look at a bunch of this stuff in action. So as it says there, an event handler is a function that you want to execute or call when an event occurs. As mentioned there, if you want to attach an event handler to an event, you call the add event listener method. All right, that accepts, as it says, a string that's the name of the event that you're listening for. Again, click or double click or whatever. All right. If you pass a constant or variable that stores a function to an event listener, you don't code the parentheses like I mentioned to you. All right. If you do, rather than attaching that, it'll just call it one time, which you don't want. And again, you can remove event listeners if they don't work or if you don't need them anymore or whatever. All right. So they mention here. In the last figure, you saw how to attach event handlers. It says this is useful if you want the same routine to run for more than one event. All right. If you don't need it to run for more than one event, you can create what's called an anonymous function instead of a function expression. An anonymous function is a function that doesn't have a name. I'm saying this again. An anonymous function is a function that does not have a name. 
All right. So right here, this is a function expression, but notice there's no name before the parens. There's no name. And here there's no name as well. So again, as mentioned to you previously, JavaScript in its own way tries to be maybe not all things to all people, but it tries to be as many different things to as many different people as there are. It gives you multiple ways of doing the same thing. My suggestion is if you learn something in a programming language, especially when you're first learning it, if, if you're taught six ways of doing it, write your own little program, do all six of them and see which one makes the most sense to you. And if one stands out, you know what, this one reads the best, I understand it the best, then for gosh sakes, use that met that way from then on. You're not impressing anybody if they give you six ways of doing something by writing a program and using all six ways, especially if one of those ways does not work. All right, so you should just get used to using what makes sense to you is what I'm saying. So as it says, if you want to use the same function as an event handler for more than one event, or if you want to be able to remove it for an event, you can assign it to a constant or a variable. So a let using a let or using a const. If you don't need to give it a name, you can give it, you can make it an anonymous function. So it does not have a name. All right. And again, by ideally at least, this is going to make more and more and more sense as we go along. All right. OK, now, so let's let's even add some more into this. OK, when an event occurs, most browsers also have what's called an event object that goes along with it. All right. And I want to mention to you why that's important. Do they give an example? Not the one I'd like to show you. And I'm not going to write something here. But in fact, I, I can. But just let me show you something here quickly. And that is, let's imagine that we've got a form. All right. So we've got a form in here and it's got a bunch of fields in it. All right. And then at the bottom of it, it's got a button that says submit. All right. But on, let's say in that, that particular form, you've got a first name, a last name, address, city, state, zip code. Uh, cell phone number and email address, those eight pieces of information. And all of them, every single one of those eight pieces of information is required. They're all required. If anything's missing, you should just stop right there and make the person fix it. All right. So why am I telling you this? Well, if you've got those eight pieces of information and, and somebody leaves off one or more, when they click the button to submit it, you want nothing to happen other than maybe showing some errors. So what you want to do is you want to prevent the default action from occurring. When you do that, you can you can from the this event that's here, you can call prevent default. Now, most of the time, I'm being general here, most of the time when you use prevent default, you are using it to stop something from getting submitted when a submit button is clicked. Not always, but most often, all right? And you use it, it's a little confusing, all right? This can be called anything you want right here. This is the event that gets passed, all right? So here are some elements that have default actions for a click event. So for instance, if you wanna set it up so that if somebody clicks a link, that nothing happens, you can do a prevent default on there. It's normally used with a submit button. All right. And when you use this, it's either called E or event or EVT, like they show you right here. All right. So what they're saying right here is check. And if they left an email off, you're going to give them an alert that says there's an error. And then we don't want the form to be submitted. So we are calling prevent default. So as they mention here on the bottom of the page, modern browsers send an event object 
to the event handler handling the event. All right, you can work with the target property to do this. This is what a lot of chapter six is going to be about. All right, and if an event being listened for has a default action and you want to make sure that default action does not happen, you can call the prevent default. And again, I'm not saying, hey, did that totally make sense to you? Because it may not have. All right. Hopefully, by going through these last two chapter, two examples, because this is the end of the chapter, going through the miles per gallon example and going through the mail list example. Hopefully, by going through these, you're going to start to see how all this stuff go, comes together. Now, previously, when we did our miles per gallon program, we did it real simply. And what I mean is everything was in the JavaScript. Everything we did was in the JavaScript. And we used a prompt to ask for how many miles you drove. We even checked it. So if it was non-numeric or it was out of range, we asked you to do it again. Then we did the same thing for gallons used. And once you put in a valid value for, for miles driven and another valid value for gallons used, we divided miles driven by gallons used to give us miles per gallon. Nothing new there. All right. But now it's going to look like this. And let's talk about a few things. I'm going to go till about five after 10, then we'll take another break. All right. Now, you'll notice CSS has been added here. We put a border around the program, a blue border, changed the H1 heading of the miles per gallon calculator and made that blue. All right. But now what, el what else is new here? Everything. We have three labels, miles driven, gallons of gas used, and miles per gallon. They're all pretty. They're all right justified, so they all line up nicely. We have three text boxes, one for miles driven, one for gallons used, one for miles per gallon. You'll notice that the miles per gallon text box is gray. What does that mean? It's been disabled because it's just like a calculator. Like the one we just looked at, if I put 400 here and 12 here, and I tell it I want them to add, that's 412, and I can't change that. All right? So H2, label, 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 input box, input box, disabled input box, and button. Hopefully you've already guessed that where we're going to put the code, all right, is, is basically we're going to associate it with the button. And what we want to make sure of is if if we leave if we put something in here that's non-numeric, or something in here that's non-numeric, or if either one of these are negative, we don't allow this to happen. So when we click this, we want to prevent the default action from happening. All right. Now, I have no doubt that every one of you could write this. I've actually got these programs, they're up someplace. I don't know if I still have them up and running here or not. Probably it looks like I don't, but we'll bring them up in just a second. But what I'm telling you is there should be nothing new here. We're bringing, here's our style sheet. All right, there's main, we've got a div, and we've actually got three divs. One div to handle everything on this line, one div to handle everything on this line, one div to handle everything on this line. So there's our first div our second div, and our third div. We even have another div to handle the button. That's all in main. Then we've got our script down on the bottom. All right. They do mention that they use the use strict directive in here, and they're going to use the add event listener method. All right. We're going to see that when we look at the JavaScript. And just So let's take a look at that. There it is. All right. And do I expect, do I expect in here 100% of this stuff to make sense to you? The answer is no. But when you noticed, if we take a look in here, if we take a look, some key things to note. All right. The ID for miles per gallon is, I'm sorry, the ID for miles driven is miles. The ID for gallons of gas used is gallons. 
the ID for miles per gallon is MPG. Those are the three big things, those IDs. All right. So when we take a look in here, I'm going to go through the JavaScript in here line by line. We do the use strict up at the top. So again, what that forces to have happen is the system will not allow if I accidentally misspell a variable someplace, it's going to flag it as an error. Whereas if I leave that out, it's just going to try to create a new variable with that name by default. Then we've got the shortcut we talked about here before. All right. Now here we're using a template literal, but we're creating a constant. And what that should say, okay, is either for that LBL, that either should say miles driven must be a number greater than zero, or it's going to say gallons of gas must be a number greater than zero. LBL that you see right there, that's going to be passed in either here, where it's miles driven, whoop, right there, or here, where it's gallons of gas used. And that's if we put in something that's non-numeric or that's negative. All right. So we're writing a generic error message right there is what I'm telling you. All right. Then we've got this thing called focus and select. It's like, what the heck is that? All right. And it's got const LM. What the heck is LM? LM is just whatever element. So it's whatever. It's going to be either the miles driven or it's going to be the gallons of gas used. All right. And if we call this routine, what that's saying is set the focus to it and select it, which means, again, it'll turn blue. So if we want to remove it, we can just hit the delete key. All right. Then we've got process entries. All right. It looks a lot different from what we've done so far. We're creating miles. And now instead of doing a prompt statement, we're grabbing what was inside of the text box with an ID of miles and we're grabbing its value. And then we're doing the same thing with gallons where we are grabbing its value. All right. So again, where this const miles equal the parse float, et cetera, that's grabbing what's in here, right there. All right, for the const gallons, that's grabbing what's ever in here. All right, after we put, after we grab both those, then we validate them. So this if statement that you see, this if, else, if, else, that's data validation. All right, so what it says is, if we left it blank, or if we put in something else, non-numeric, or we made it negative, we want to pass miles driven to this. So it will give us a message that says miles driven must be a valid number greater than zero. All right, so we want it to do that. And then we want to do focus and select, which is going to highlight whatever's in here and allow us to change it. Then we do the same thing for the gallons used, okay? So here, this is just checking the miles. If we put in 300, which would be valid, we skip everything in the if, and we go down to the else. So we do make similar checks, but on the gallons. So again, if we left the gallons blank, or put in something non-numeric, or made it negative, now we're gonna take gallons of gas used and we're going to pass that will become the label and it'll say gallons of gas used must be a valid number greater than zero. So if we put in a valid number here, it skips this. If we put in a valid number here and when we, we're putting them in there. So if we put in third 300 and 12. All right, then this if will be skipped, this if or this else if will be skipped and it'll actually do the math. Let's divide it by gallons dot two fixed and it'll put that into mpg all right then the last thing on the bottom here this says whenever you click the calculate button when you click the calculate button add an event listener 
so call the process entry routines. Process entries function. So only call this when that function has been clicked. All right. And finally, this says when the program starts to run, right there, put the cursor inside of the first text box. Now, I don't know how much sense that made to all of you watching. Some of you would probably made more sense than others. But either way, it's okay. We didn't use the prevent default in here. We didn't have to. One thing they did do in here is they used arrow functions to streamline the code. There is an arrow function. There is an arrow function. You didn't have to do that. All right. This get error message, the focus and select, and this dollar sign that was up at the top right there, those are called helper functions. They're also known as utility functions. They can make your code easier to write. Off times too with these functions, then you write utility functions if you want to use something more than once. All right, next, we're just going to finish this page and we'll take a break. The add event listener is used to attach an anonymous function. All right, for the documents, DOM content loaded event. More on that in chapter six. All right, within that event handler, as it says, the code attaches the process entries function. When you click, I just mentioned that. And it says, since the code in this file runs in the DOM content loaded event, it's safe to use even if you put this into the head instead of putting it into the body like we have it. All right. Now, again, that may have made some sense to you, a little sense to you, or not much sense at all to you. I don't know. It is 10.08. Take until 10.20. Then we are going to finish this, and I will blast through Chapter 5 fairly quickly. All right, so come back at 10.20, please.
All right, it is 1020, so I'm going to continue on. The hope is that uh, I can spend approximately 15 minutes now at, at the most going over this email list application and then another 15 minutes approximately. All right, going over um, 15 minutes to a half an hour going over chapter five. If we get both those done, then tomorrow we will go over chapter seven. I wanted to mention too, this is for all of you, even if this is your first class. If you're not aware of it, and if you have any interest, tomorrow um, there is a job fair at the Rankin St. Louis campus. Now, it might be too far a drive for you. You might have no interest. You might be busy. I get all that stuff. There will be approximately 400 companies there. All right. It'll be by the main building across from the main building for Rankin, and it's in the automotive center. You you may have a, tr have a problem parking. I'm just telling you that right now. All right. If you're interested in going, but there will be approximately 20 to 30 companies there that are looking for people who uh, are in the field that you're in. The reason I'm telling you this, and I'm I, again, I don't mean to bore you with too many stories, but I want to tell you this is true. This is what happened to me. All right. Years ago, um, my sister-in-law and her uh, ex-husband, um, they were having, they were going to have a baby. Ex-husband had just taken a job at a company in Illinois. Well, she literally had just had the baby, so she was not in the mood for traveling. He saw me and said, hey, Jeff, I've got accommodations for two, for two nights. Would you like to go with me? You know, he, he, and he said, uh, you know, just drive around, et cetera. I said, yeah, sure. So we did. I'm, I'm trying to make this story as short as possible. Okay, we get to the hotel. And um, I go to the, I'm, I'm in the bathroom. I come out. And he's on the phone. And he's like, yeah, he'll be there tomorrow at 9 o'clock. And I'm like, who will be there at 9 o'clock? And he said, you have an interview tomorrow at 9 o'clock for a job for where, where I'm going to work. And I said, Dennis, I, I don't even, I don't know anything about computers. At the time, I had a degree in journalism. That was it. But I went to the interview anyway. All right. And what I'm trying to tell you is I went to this interview. I had no experience. And the guy said, well, if you go back and get a two year degree, you know, I'd probably we'd probably be interested in hiring you because we don't see many people who come into this field who can't communicate. So I did go back and I got it. All right. After the first year. There was another there was a job fair. All right. Back in Illinois. So I drove down there for it. And lo and behold, the same guy who interviewed me. All right. I had sent him a couple resumes during that time to let him know about my progress. He closed his eyes and he said, Jeff Scott, and he recited my resume to me. Well, then I graduated, sent another resume. They ended up hiring me and I worked there for three and a half years. All I'm saying is if you do go to the job fair, you know, you can maybe make a contact or two. All right. Get business cards from people. These are the kind of people that typically you're going to want to send resumes to eventually. All right, end of that sermon. So, um, real, real quick, sure. Question on that. Are these job fairs every semester? So, there will be yes, one there the is one class? per semester. Yes, great question. Thank you. There is also um, every semester, there is one in Perryville and there is one in Wentzville as well. Now, the Perryville one. And I'm only telling you this because I heard it from one of the instructors there. The Perryville campus is very small. Literally, they have no more than two or three employers that come into their job fair. All right, the one that we have in Wentzville, because I've gone to it several times, um, they get about 50 to 100 employers there. All right, but usually there's just a small handful, like two to five that are interested in IT people, all right? The, like I said, um, I've got a listing that I can send out to all of you if you have an interest, and it'll show you, you know, just the AWD, for example, and I know there were at least 15 companies, and there were a bunch of other companies that were IT comma AWD. So yeah, usually there is one in fall that there will be, you know, late October, 
something like that before the weather really starts changing. And then there's usually one in mid-March. You know, it's tomorrow. The one in Wentzville will be, um, I believe it's two weeks from tomorrow on the 30th. All right. I don't know when the one in Perryville is. That probably wouldn't interest anybody anyway because that'd be too long a drive. But this thing tomorrow is nine until noon. You know, if you have an interest in going, I would just say, you know, if you do have a resume, make some copies and go down there. And even if you are a first semester, you can just say, hey, I just want to see what this is all about. All right. And you never know. You might make a contact. OK. So the last example that's in this chapter is this email list that we were. We talked about since chapter one. As it says in this application, the user enters data for three text boxes and clicks the join list. It checks for validity, so it's doing data validation checks. If anything is invalid, you get a dialog box with an error message for each invalid entry. So you'd have either zero invalid, one invalid, two invalid, or all three invalid. If there are zero invalid entries, if they're all valid, then the data is submitted to the server. It really isn't, but we act as though it was. In addition, as it says here, there is a clear form button. When you click that, whatever is in any of the three text boxes is cleared out. All right, um, let's see. They're not gonna show the CSS here. Okay, they're telling you that right now. Okay, and it says in the body of the HTML, You'll notice that the label and the input elements are coded within a form element. In addition, they're all going to have IDs set up. All right, so let's take a look at that. So jump into here. So this is what it looks like. And it looks like they're having an error like this. I don't know why they're doing that, but they are. All right, typically you'd want the error to be off to the right or down below or up above, but they're not doing it that way. I think they're doing these errors with alerts, it looks like. So key takeaways here. You'll notice in the form, again, a div for the first row, a div for the second row, a div for the third row, and a div for the buttons. So there's row one with the address for email address, and the row two with re-entering email address, row three for the name, and row four for the buttons. In addition, IDs, email one, ID email two, ID first name, and ID clear form. We're adding the JavaScript file here, which I believe will be on the next page. So here's the JavaScript. All right, there's enough of it here. So what are we doing? All right, well, what this is doing right here it's a little confusing because you haven't seen it done exactly like that before. But what that's saying is, hey, as soon as the DOM has been loaded into memory, run this. That starts here on this line, it's in yellow, and it ends here, right there. In fact, I'm wrong. It starts here and it ends at the very bottom. So what are we doing here? <clears throat> This is an anonymous function, and it's an anonymous arrow function. This is saying whenever you click the join list button, we want this event listener to run. What's it going to do? It's going to grab the value from all three text boxes. That's what these three lines are doing. Then it's creating something called error message. All right. And if anyone, if this is empty, so if there's nothing in the email, it'll add to the error message, first email is required. All right, and it'll do the same thing for the second one. And then it'll check to make sure that whatever was put in the first email was also in the second email. And then it'll also make sure that there's something inside of the first name text box. And you'll notice with each one of these, it's saying error message plus equal. All right, and the reason that that is important is you don't have any idea when they run the program, the order in which they're gonna enter things. They may enter just the first name 
and then do the confirm email address and then do the email address. That wouldn't be kind of silly, but they could do it any way they wanted. We want to make sure that when we are printing out their error messages, we concatenate them. So if we, if all three were wrong, all three were left blank, let's say, then the error message will say first name or first email is required, then on a new line, second email is required, then on another new line, this one it probably won't even do because they will be equal if they're both empty, but then it'll also say first name is required. If any of these happen, so if the error message is not equal, I would have put two equal signs there, they didn't. But if the error message is not blank, what does that mean? That means you want to show the error message, and that's the alert, but we don't want the action of submitting the form to take place. So we do that EVT dot prevent. Then finally, we're adding another event listener here, and that says that if we click the button that says clear form, which is right there. So if we click that button, we want this, we basically, we want this function to run. And what is that doing? That is clearing out the value from all three text boxes. All right, and it is setting the focus. All right, this is setting the focus anytime right there, this line that you see in gray, that's setting it anytime we click the button that says clear form. This one right here is what's running it when we start the program. So it's making sure that when we start the program, that the what's that the cursor is in the first text box. Now I went over that quickly and it may not have made a lot of sense to you. All right, but it is imperative that you go in and you take a look at this stuff because if you don't, it's not going to make sense. All right, everybody can, can look at this stuff and eventually you have your own aha type of moment. And it's happened with a lot of different students. I don't get this. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, when, uh, like I said, probably tomorrow night, I'm going to write your pretest. And I'm going to give you, on Monday, I'll go over it and I'll take most of the, most of the period to go over it, but I'll write everything from scratch. And guess what? Two of the, th there are going to be three problems on it. One of them probably will, make to, will be to take this calculator and make it look better, so to speak. All right. In other words, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just put in some labels and some other, you know, et cetera. We'll HTML it, if you want to call it that. One will be for you to redo the BMI program and to redo that one in the same way, you know, with, with labels and text boxes, et cetera. And one will be for that guessing game. All right. And the good news about that, and we'll get to it after tomorrow's lecture, but especially for the one, we'll also do some work with images in there. All right. Okay. So I'm going to quickly jump through this and jump over to, and I, I guess I should mention this just so you see it. All right. That, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time going over the little review or the terms. All right. A lot of these terms are what you get in your um, in your written test. So if you've gone over them, that should make the written test almost a piece of cake. I don't typically go through the summaries that are in here, but what you may find, what you may find is good for you is to go through these exercises at the end. The reason I say that is you can try them yourselves but you've got what's called the EX starts, so the exercise starts, and you have the solutions. So you can try something, and if it doesn't work, you can look at the solution. You don't have to do these. You don't ever have to do them. I think my, my feeling is you get enough homework in here anyway. But if that helps, here they're building a second future value application. So if that helps, yeah, please take a look at it. All right, so I'm going to jump into Chapter 5 now how to test and debug a program. What you should notice is 
It is about 15 pages long. So we should be able to finish it hopefully by 11 o'clock. We will talk about the differences between testing and debugging. We'll talk about the types of errors that can occur in a program, some of the common errors, and how to debug using Chrome's developer tools, which is what I've already been showing you. All right, I've started to. And there's other debug methods that we'll talk about as well. Now, hopefully what I'm about to say to you makes sense. The only way I could test you on this stuff that's right here, the only way I could literally test you on this stuff on a test, I mean, a way of doing it at least, would be to write a program that had errors in it and have you find them. I, I've tried that before. Some students like it and are very good at it. Some people that drove them nuts. So I'm not going to do that. So even though your test next week will be on four, five, and seven, 90% of it will be on four, 10% of it will be on seven, and virtually 0% of it will be on five. But, you know, you write yourself a JavaScript program, it doesn't work. The idea is now we're showing you the means that you can look at to try to figure out why it didn't work. All right. Okay. When you test a program, you run it to make sure it works correctly. Now notice at the end of that paragraph, it says the goal of testing is to make an application fail. That may sound a little weird, but it's true. If you are creating software for someone, it's much better that you get the software to fail than it is for you to go and put it out company and have it fail for them. In fact, where I used to, where I got my first programming job, all right, I had to write code. The I was responsible for a telephone switching system, not all of it. Our whole switching system was approximately was between three and five million lines. I was responsible for I'd say about ten thousand of those lines. All right, of those lines of code is what I mean. And what happened was when I'd add new features and new functionality. And I got it, I'd have to take it into our lab and make sure it worked. And once it did, I had to turn it over to our system test people. Their goal was to break my code. That was their job. Because they wanted them to break it rather than having it go out into the field and then having it break. All right. So when you test, you're trying to make your code fail. When you debug, you're trying to fix errors or bugs that were in a program. OK, you may or may not have heard the story. I'll make it quick. There was a commander in the U.S. Navy, a lady named Grace Hopper, who was about four and a half feet tall, who discovered the first program bug. She was working on an old fashioned computer, the ones that used to be as big as, you know, as, as, a, as a house almost. And the computer wasn't working or I shouldn't say the computer, the program wasn't working. She tested to make sure at that time they were using big tubes, that no tubes were burnt out, etc. Everything looked fine. She looked at her logic. It looked fine. They took the computer apart and they found out that in the back of the computer was a moth. That was literally, no joking intended, that was the first computer bug and that's how it got its name. All right, they took it out, ran the program and it worked. All right. There are three basic types of errors that can occur. The first are syntax errors. All right, that's kind of what I've been showing you right now. That's pretty much most of the errors that I've been showing you when I've run the program and I've gone into the console have been syntax errors. That's rules of the language. Imagine that you're, what is it? A second grader and it's, it's the week after spring vacation and you're, as now Jimmy, now Johnny, now Mary, now Sue, I want you to write a one page paper on what you did during your vacation. And Johnny, who's not the best student, writes everything. It's all one page and it's all in one sentence. So he writes one sentence that's got 500 words in it. Well, he's broken the syntax of the English language, the, the rules of the language. JavaScript 
is very lax if you break a lot of the syntax rules. I've shown you some of those where when you break a rule such as you don't put in a semicolon, it still works. But if I, if I write the word alert and I write A-L-R-T instead of A-L-E-R-T, I'm going to get a syntax error. All right. The JavaScript engine throws what's called an, an exception or an error that stops the program from running. All right. In fact, syntax errors, you know, depending on what you're using, you've already seen this kind of thing. But if I come back in here and I go in here and I type in this, let's see. We don't have an alert in here, but let's just put one in. All right. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say alert. Hello. I'm not going to run the program, but you'd see that if I did. Now I'm going to misspell it. All right. Now, what we have here is an editor, not an IDE, but there is a syntax error in there right now. Right there, there's a syntax error. How do I know that? I'm going to show you. So I'm going to do a file, save all, and then I'm going to come back into here, and I'm going to run this. Now, it's still going to work. But watch what happens now when I say to run the program again, and I'll say yes. Now it breaks. Why did it break? Because when I go into inspect, it says ALRT is not defined. All right. That technically, you could look at that as being either a syntax error or a runtime error. Technically, it's a runtime error because it didn't, it didn't show until I was actually running the program. All right. Then there's a logic error. If I meant to right here when I did the calculate product, if I accidentally put in here a plus sign and I put in 17 and five, it'll say 17 times five equals 22. That's a logic error. As your programs get more and more complex, logic errors get harder and harder to figure out and flush out. They just do. All right, I've had people come up to me when I've been in the classroom and they're, they're like, I, I, I've been looking at this for quite a while. I don't know what the problem is. Well, sometimes I can look at it and in one second know what the problem is. All right. Other times, no, I, I get sucked into their vortex as well. And <clears throat> I can't figure out the problem. I know that this was a good 10 or more years ago on a program. While students were working on a, a different program. And it wasn't working for the life of me. I couldn't figure out why. And I had a student come up and say, um, can you help me with this? And I helped them and they got done and they said, hey, you're missing. I don't even remember what it was. You're missing this on your code. And it was something I'd been looking at it for quite a while. I just looked right past it. I had a logic error. All right. So the goal of testing to find all the errors before you put it in production. The goal of debugging is to fix all those errors. The three types of errors, syntax violates the rules of language, runtime it's when the program is being run, and logic they don't cause errors, but the results are wrong. All right. So some of the common errors, misspelling keywords, omitting parentheses, omitting curly braces. All right. Not, you know, starting with an opening quote or double quote and ending with a single or vice versa. The number four there, omitting the semicolon, we don't need that. Misspelling an identifier. All right. So I want to show you this. Since we did come in here, and since we put up here using strict, I'm going to come down here. And let's let's come down to here at the bottom where I'm putting all this stuff out. And I'm going to say, um, let's see, name equals Jeff. All right. And then I'm going to say alert name. And you'll notice there's a line through name right now. All right. It says name is deprecated. Don't do that here. Okay, fine. I'll do F name for my first name. 
All right, and I'll put that as an F name as well. All right, so I'm doing that. So file, save all. All right, and I'm gonna run the program again. Three, four. And it stopped. Why did it stop? I view page source, not to view page source, I'm sorry. If I go to inspect and I click console, it says F name is not defined. All right. And you might say, I'm going to show you why it's a big deal. I'm going to take this where we said using strict or use strict. I'm going to comment that out. Just like that. And I'm going to do a file, save all, and I'm going to run the program again. And notice it said Jeff, and it says, do you want to run the program again? And it's going to allow me to. When it gets all done, it'll say Jeff. And the reason that that is important is, in the first case, I put use strict there. And it basically said, if I use a variable without declaring it first with a const or a let, flag it. But when I left the use strict out, it didn't do that. So use strict requires you to become a better programmer. I am going to ask, and I'll probably even make it worth a point or two on your next test that you have the use strict in for each one of yours, each one of your programs. All right. Um. Stop these runs here and go back to here. All right. And they give you other places where you can find errors. There's all sorts of places. The good news is when, you, when you're learning how to debug, you know, it's, and you're also learning the language, you know, what better time to learn to debug? All right, because you're going to make mistakes. Everybody does. I make plenty of mistakes. When you are planning a test run, like they're showing here, I want to say this again. When you are planning a test run, okay? In fact, I'm going to show you in just a second. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to show you a better example, all right, <clears throat> of doing a test run. What do I mean? Well, let's look at it. If you remember when we did the, the thing in here, for BMI, example, that the height had to be between 12 and 96, that the weight had to be between 1 and 777. So when I'm planning a test run, all right, we're going to, I'm going to add here number. And I'm going to add here number. So when I'm planning a test run, what do I want to do at a minimum? Well, let's just think about it for a minute. For height. All right, number one. I want to test blank. If I put nothing in there, is it handled? For number two, I want to test non-numeric input. So I want to make sure I have an is NAN in there. For number three, I want to check a number that's out of range, so like 11. For number four, I want to check a number that's out of range in the other direction, like 97. Number five, I want to check my end cases. So I want to check, does 12 work correctly? Does 96 work correctly? Then I want to just grab some number in between there, 72, and make sure that works correctly. And I want to do a similar thing with weight. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I need a test run. Okay, so that'll be zero, and this will be seven, seven, eight. And then this will be, these are all valid, so this will be 12. All right, for, uh, wait a minute, this, that's height. Yeah, this is weight, so that was one was the minimum. And 
777 was the maximum. And I'll try 111 here. All I'm showing you here are these are values at a minimum. I should be running 14 tests on my code and know what the expected outcome is on each one of those. All right. Think about it. If I tried to test everything, if my valid height is between 96 and 12, that's 85 possible values. If my weight between uh, 1 and 777, that's 777 values. There are thousands of, of different combinations there. But if I do this, I could be pretty confident that what I'm trying to do is working. All right. All right. So as it says, test the data, the data, the app rather, with valid data to make sure the results are correct. Test it with invalid data. And most people do test it with valid first. I, I'll always remember this. I had a student once we were doing, it wasn't BMI, but it was a fairly simple first program. And I, I, I asked her, why are you having problems? And, and, and she said, well, can you come over here and look at this? And she was putting in like for testing for numbers instead of like one, two, three or 10, 20, 30, she was using pi. She had 3.14159. I said, why are you using that? Well, it's valid, yeah. But when you're first testing it, all right, you should make give it easy values that you can very easily verify that the results are correct. All right. It says list the valid entries that you're going to make and the correct results for each, then the invalid ones. So that's kind of what I just showed you. Common testing problems, not testing a wide enough range. All right, not knowing what the results of each range should be. Again, fairly easy to find syntax and runtime errors, fairly difficult to find logic errors. That's why typically most companies of any size will have a system test team or have individuals who did not write the code do a final test on the code. Whether you realize it or not, like it or not, accept it or not, when you start to write your own code in a way, you become married to that code. It's very hard for you to see errors in it. It's just the way it works. All right. It says back in chapter one, we were introduced to Chrome's developer tools. Now I've shown you some of this stuff already, just so you know. All right. Now, one thing I did not show you is when we were back doing our simple programs here. In fact, let's go back. To, do I have that one up? Probably not. Um, well, let's do this. All right. Where we've got all these alerts at the bottom. That's it's totally fine what we've done right there. And I want to get rid of this F name equals, etc. All right. But I'm going to come in here and I'm going to type in this. Um, let's see. I want to change this just a little bit. I'm going to change it like this. I'm going to say let output str, our output string, equal this. Then I'm just going to keep adding to it. So it's now got this, and this, and this, and this. Whoops. And now we can say, uh, as an example, I can say alert output str. Okay. This should, keyword here is should, work exactly as it did before, but there's a reason I'm showing this to you. So let me do a file, save all, and try to run it, make sure that it still works and I didn't break anything. All right. 35 and 12. Oh, I broke something. Okay. ERT is not defined on line 95. Okay, there it is, ERT. I, I, some of the word from alert is was still in there. So let me try it again. All right, 12 and 9. 12. Well, everything's in there now 
it, I needed a BR tag, but it's all working. Okay. So why, why am I even taking the time to show you that? All right. Because what we can do when we're doing this, what we can do. Okay. So let's change all these. Um, let's see. I don't know if it wants a backslash N here or a BR, but I'm going to try a backslash N. Whoopsie. Now, if it's not a backslash N, of course, then it is a BR. So let me run it again. There, it worked. Okay, good. So why am I showing you that? Who cares? You should. All right. And what I mean is this. You what you find is people who are running programs like this, not very often they're going to do this and put an alert out there. But what you can say here is console.log output str like that. Now I'm going to comment this one out. And I'm going to do a file, save all. All right. And I'm going to run my program again. And as soon as I start to run the program like this, I'm going to right mouse click. Well, I guess it'll make me put the numbers in first, but I'm going to put in 55 and six. All right. Oh, I don't have an alert in there anymore. That's right. Well, do I want to run the program again? No. And I don't know if it'll work now or not. But if I go over here and I go to console, that's what I wanted to show you. All right, I, sh I should have opened it up like this. So let me put the alert back in there and run it one last time. Well, it's not letting me do it. But what you can do with a console.log is I can have it show on the screen as well so that it won't disappear like this is doing. All right, I'm doing a poor job of showing you that, and I'm sorry. But a lot of programmers, what they will do is they will take messages, and rather than using alerts all over the place, they will use a console.log message. All right, and that means just literally that, log it out to the console, all right? And when you do that, there's also a warning and that'll print things out. I think it's kind of like in an amber color and there's a console.error, which will print things out in red. So those are other things that you can use if you so desire as debugging tools, all right? All right, let's finish this up then. So they're showing you some problems in here. And again, it's very similar to what I'd shown you. So notice is NAN is not defined because that N should be capitalized there and it's not. All right. So to open up the developer tools, I always just right mouse click and hit F12 or you can and choose inspect. You can hit F12. All right. They give you some tips on how to find the statement. Usually it gives you a number. And normally what that means is, you know, that number is either the number that it appeared on or it was something above that. All right. And if you don't use Chrome for whatever reason, you know, you use uh, Edge or you use um, Firefox, they all have their own version of this. All right, you can also set breakpoints in your code. When you set a breakpoint, all right, as it says, you come into, into your code like this and you right mouse click and you go to the, your, <clears throat> you bring up your developer tools, but what you can do then is you can go over to sources and it'll show you the code. Then you can click on any number here. 
This is also called the gutter area, and it'll make that blue and it'll make the line gray. Then what happens is when it gets to that line, the program will stop running. It'll pause itself. So you can check the value of values then by putting your mouse over something. All right. But it stops right there. Okay. And there's ways that you can step through your code doing that. If you want to put in no, if you want to put in absolutely no, when you run your program, you can keep hitting the F11 key. All right, what does that mean? See if I can do that. All right, I don't know if that works with this editor or not, but we'll try it. Nope, it doesn't like it. All right, plus I'm, I'm also running my team software. But when you run it, the idea is it with F11, it runs through your code a line at a time. You can see what's happening on each line and stop it at any time. All right. There is a step over and a step out, which allows you to run functions and either does step through them. All right. Or doesn't step through them. And there's a resume. So if you stop, you can start it up again. So there's a lot of different things that you can do in here. All right. You can run what's called a program trace on your code. What that will do, notice they're using the console login here. See what they're doing? They're doing this future value calculator. And every time, all right, that says it started, but every time you're in the loop with a console log, it's printing. So this would be year one, year two, year three, year four, et cetera. And the idea is that if you run this, so let's suppose you put a wrong calculation in up here. So instead of saying divide it by 100, you said times 100 accidentally. And if you come down here and you notice, wow, this is supposed to be about 13 or 14,000, and instead it's 150,000, you can look through here and see where it broke. All right, you're tracing through your code logic, for lack of better words. All right, and there's more than one way of doing this. All right, again, I already mentioned this. You can do console.error that appears in red, console.warning, which appears, it's not really yellow, I think it's more amber, and you can do a console, uh, a stack trace. The traces are kind of the neat one because what a, what a trace will do is it'll show you every routine from the last one that was called, one that was called. So if it's your code, it'll show you all the functions that were called in the order they were called from the last one that was called to the first one that was called. That can sometimes be very helpful as well as far as looking at stuff. Viewing the HTML and the CSS, well, to view the HTML, you already know it's right mouse click and view source, or clicking with the, uh, looking at the CSS, it's again going to the inspector, but using styles or elements or whatever to look through that. So that's nothing new. You've done that already. All right. So last thing I'm going to tell you. We got through all this and it's still just a little bit after 11. All right. So tomorrow. What I will do once I get through this. Is I'm going to go through chapter seven. It is not a long chapter. All right, it's how to work with images, do an image swap, and use timers. So we'll look at those, all right? And then tomorrow, and I, I'll make sure it's not a super long class like today's unfortunately has become, but tomorrow we will look in and you will have work from four, five, and seven. Seven is just debugging. I think you can do that yourselves. But we'll do one or both of these together and or this one. Then we'll go over on the other ones. And again, four has got three problems. Seven has got two problems. We'll do one or more of these. 
I still expect you to do those and turn them in. But I will do them with you, all right? And you will have that. I do not, when I do the homework problems, I do not save those out to a GitHub repo. What I do hope to have time to do by the end of the day today is to take this stuff that I created for you in two different formats, all right? One with all global variables and the other one, even though I moved them to all local, uh, there, all local variables, put those out there and then rerun this one or rewrite this one again and use function expressions and rewrite it one more time and use arrow functions. So you'll have four versions of this out there. All right, and I'll put that all into the same repo. Okay, and that should ho hopefully, hopefully rather help you if you're struggling with any of this stuff. All right, Grant, unless you have any questions, that's all I had for today. I do not, thank you. Okay, thank you. Talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for showing up. Have a good one. You too.